All right, brethren, let's seek to pick up where we left off in the previous hour as we continue to examine this second element of that which comprises a biblical call to the pastoral office, namely the clear indications of an enlarged, balanced, and tested Christian experience. The first, which I addressed in the previous hour, a proven love for and devoted attachment to the person of Christ. And now the second, and it's listed at the top of page 11 of your printed notes, is what I've described as a personal and perceptive acquaintance with the fundamental workings of sin and grace in the soul. And you say, what in the world do you mean by that bunch of words? A personal and perceptive acquaintance with the fundamental workings of sin and grace in the soul. Well, let me seek to explain myself. The framework of the apostolic witness was in many ways unique, as we alluded to in the previous hour. They were eyewitnesses. Their testimony was validated by true signs and wonders. But, just as in their calling, there were principles that were present in their ministries that are present in every valid ministry of an ordinary servant of Christ laboring in the pastoral office. And one such principle is found in the words of 1 John 1 and verse 3, where John says, That which we have seen and heard declare we unto you. Now that was a unique element of apostolic testimony. They actually saw and heard the Christ in the days of his humiliation. They saw him and touched him and heard him subsequent to his resurrection and prior to his ascension to the right hand of the Father. But there is a principle. They were trafficking in that which was part of their own experience. Again, in Acts 4.20, after two of them have been warned and told to be silent and not to preach, they responded by saying, we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. Mm -hmm. And it is that principle that I'm seeking to capture in the words that if we would be recognized as gifts of Christ to his people, then there must be some clear indications of this personal and perceptive acquaintance with the fundamental workings of sin and grace in the soul. Now what do I mean the fundamental workings of sin and of grace in the soul? Well, here I'm going to hide behind the quality control of the men of the past. And the first is a quotation from a sermon preached on the subject of ministerial guilt on May 21st, 1844 at the General Assembly of the Free Church of Scotland by a servant of Christ by the name of C.J. Brown. And the title of the sermon, as I've indicated, was Ministerial Guilt. And I pick up at this point where he said to his fellow ministers, As we ought not to be ministers at all, however, if we be not Christians, regenerated men, so assuming this, that is, that we are regenerate men, I believe that one of our chief sins and the parent of all other evils in the really Christian ministry together is to be found in the low state of godliness of the life of God in our own souls. I'm aware that this statement is liable to be misunderstood, and all I can afford time to say to obviate misapprehension is just this, that I am not here comparing us with our former selves. In this view, perhaps, we may have made some happy progress. And this, that we are not quite so far off as before, may just be the secret of our seeing more distinctly today our fearful distance from the mark. I am comparing our spiritual state with such words, such notes of a lively and prosperous Christian as the following. And then he quotes the Apostle Paul. Our conversation is in heaven. Thy word was found of me, and I did eat it, Jeremiah, and it was unto me the joy and rejoicing of my heart. Paul again, to me to live is Christ, 
Genesis. Enoch walked with God. Paul, I pressed to the mark. David, my soul thirsts for God, the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? Now let me try, if I can, bring out in a sentence or two the vital connection between this state of soul and the discharge of the whole work of the ministry. See it, for instance, in that word of Paul, 2 Timothy 1.12. I suffer these things, nevertheless I am not ashamed, for... Mark the secret of his heroic bearing. We talk of the magnanimity, the heroism of Paul, but observe the secret of all his labors and toils and sufferings. For I know, says he, whom I have believed, and I am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. Ah, that it is that will make a man go through the flames for Christ, that element deep and strong in his soul. I know whom I have believed, and am persuaded he is able to keep that which I have committed to him. Or, see it in the words of David, we were just singing, Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation, and uphold me with thy free spirit. Then will I teach transgressors thy ways, and sinners shall be converted unto thee. Then, Lord, how shall I teach thy ways, unless I am seeking to walk close and straight in them myself? Unless restored and upheld by thy good spirit, I am both discovering and loathing my own ways, and constantly seeking to tread in thine, or take it thus. Our themes, fathers and brethren, the hinges of the ministry, are sin and Christ. Well, how shall a man discover the sins of others, solidly and tenderly, not harshly, but tenderly and lovingly, who is not seeing and weeping in secret places over his own iniquities? And as for Christ, the very idea of Christ, the beloved of the Father, his elect in whom his soul delights, is one of the heart and of the soul. It is not to be taken up by mere intellectual apprehension. The love of Christ constrains us, says Paul, giving the spring of all his labors. Lovest thou me, Peter? Then feed my lambs, feed my sheep. Thou canst never feed them otherwise. That which we have seen and heard declare we unto you, out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaks. You see what the man was doing back in 1844? He was seeking to address his fellow ministers and tell them, if your ministry would be owned of God, it must come out of the matrix of this personal and perceptive acquaintance with the fundamental workings of sin and of grace in the soul. Yet no human author that I've consulted more accurately and more uh, extensively addresses this than does Owen. And I've sought to give you a number of references, and I'll not quote from all of them. Let me just give you the heads and a little taste to whet your appetite. Volume 16, page 85. Dealing with the requirements for the office of pastoral labor. It belongs unto them on the account of their pastoral office to be ready, willing, and able to comfort, relieve, and refresh those that are tempted, tossed, wearied with fears and grounds of disconsolation in times of trial and desertion. The tongue of the learned is required of them that they should know how to speak a word in season to him that is weary. One excellent qualification of our Lord Jesus Christ in the discharge of his priestly office now in heaven is that he is touched with the feeling of our infirmities and knows how to succor them that are tempted. His whole flock in his world are a company of tempted ones. His own life on earth he called the time of his temptation. And those who have the charge of his flock under him ought to have a sense of their infirmities and endeavor in an especial manner to succor them that are tempted. And then he talks about the children of God who grow through periods of desertion, the buffetings of Satan, the injection of blasphemous thoughts. And he says, how can a man minister to such sheep? if he's a stranger to those things in his own experience. He will sit there with a look of incredulity upon his face saying, what in the world are you talking about? 
a sense of desertion. What are you talking about? Being at prayer and having blasphemous thoughts, as it were, injected into your mind. I don't know what in the world you're talking about. Owen is saying, unless a man has some element of experience in the fundamental workings of sin and grace in the soul, how can he be a true shepherd? To minister to God's distressed sheep. For these things are part and parcel of their experience. And then Owen goes on to state, to be able rightly to understand the various cases that will occur of this kind, from such principles and grounds of truth and experience, as will bear a just confidence in a prudent application unto the relief of them concerned, In other words, to have the tongue of the learned, to know how to speak a word in season. Then he anticipates the question, where will I acquire this knowledge? It will not be done by a collection and determination of cases, which yet is useful in its place. The old Puritans works on cases of conscience, back to his directory. He's saying fundamentally, you'll not get it from there. Where will you get it? But a skill understanding and experience in the whole nature of the work of the Spirit of God on the souls of men, of the conflict that is between the flesh and the Spirit, of the methods and wiles of Satan, of the wiles of principalities and powers or wicked spirits in high places, of the nature and effects and ends of divine (coughs) desertions, with wisdom to make application out of such principles or fit medicines and remedies unto every sore and distemper are required hereunto. These things are by some despised, and many in our day would despise them as the ravings of a fanatic, of a a half-crazed mystic. These things by some are despised, by some neglected, by some looked after only in stated cases of conscience. But he says, true pastors must obtain this skill and understanding by diligent study of the scripture, meditation thereon, fervent prayer, experience of spiritual things and temptations in their own souls with a prudent observation of the manner of God's dealings with others, and the ways of opposition made to the work of His grace in them. Without these things, listen to Owen, without these things, all pretenses unto this ability and duty of the pastoral office are vain. Whence it is that the whole work of it is much neglected. In other words, if Owen were sitting down on an eldership to examine whether or not a judgment should be made by the church as to your fitness or mine to assume the pastoral office, he'd probe us to see if there was at least a modicum of that deposit of understanding wrought in the crucible of our own Christian experience of the workings of sin and grace. And if it were not there... If Owen sensed we were sincere but simply untaught, I think he'd lay his hand upon the shoulder and say, Now, son, you pray to have dealings with God at least that will match the struggles and the dealings with God of the rank and file of your people. God bless you for your desire, but God bless you with sufficient acquisition of experience that will make you competent to do the work of a shepherd after my own heart. For isn't that the promise of Christ under the new covenant? I will give them shepherds after my own heart who shall feed them with knowledge and understanding. Knowledge and understanding fitted to do what? To meet them at the place of their real need. And much of that need grows out of the realities of the workings of sin and of grace in the human soul. Then there are some other choice quotes from Owen. I'll bypass them, but let me give you this quote from James Stewart's book on preaching, page 29. It is one of the mightiest safeguards of a man's ministry to be aware that the hungry, I'm sorry, of that hungry demand for reality breaking inarticulately from the hearts of those to whom he ministers. For that cry puts everything shoddy, second-hand, or artificial to shame. You don't need to be eloquent, or clever, or sensational, or skilled in dialectic. But you must be real. To fail there is to fail abysmally and tragically. 
It is to damage incalculably the cause you represent. Anything savoring of unreality in the pulpit is a double offense. Let me urge upon you two considerations. On the one hand, you will be preaching to people who've been grappling all the week with the stern realities behind the congregation assembling for worship. There are stories of heavy anxiety and fierce temptation, of loneliness and heroism, of overwork and lack of work, of physical strain and mental wear and tear. We wrong them and we mock their struggles if we preach our gospel in abstraction from the hard facts of their experience. That's a profound statement. We wrong them and we mock their struggles if we preach our gospel in abstraction from the hard facts of their experience. It is not only that they can detect at once the hollowness of such a performance, though that is true, There is also this, that to offer pedantic theorizings and academic irrelevances to souls wrestling in the dark is to sin against the Lord who died for them and yearns for their redemption. Powerful, powerful words. But there's a further indictment. He had two heads of unreality in preaching. This is rooted not so much in the hard problems men and women are facing, what Whittier called this maddening maze of things, as in the very nature of the Christian faith itself, the gospel is quite shattering in its realism. It shirks nothing. It never seeks to gloss over the dark perplexities of the sovereignty of God, frustration, sin, and death, or to gild on palatable facts with a coating of pious verbiage or facile consolation. It never sidetracks uncomfortable questions with some naive and cheerful cliché about providence or progress. It gazes open-eyed at the most menacing and savage circumstances life can show. It is utterly courageous. Its strength is the complete absence of utopian illusions. It thrusts Golgotha upon men's vision and bids them look at that. The very last charge that can be brought against the gospel is that of sentimentality, of blinking the facts away. It is devastating in its veracity, and its realism is a consuming fire. Powerful words. And brethren, if there isn't something about our ministries at the outset, surely as we grow as Christians, as we grow as ministers, and we have a larger and larger stock, I'm not saying put the experience of a 50-year-old man in a man in his 30s. No, but I am saying if there is not a modicum of experiential acquaintance with the fundamental struggles of the soul of the average believer as he seeks to go on with God and live in the real world, how in the world can we be received as a gift of Christ to perfect them when we're out of touch with the things that form the nuts and bolts of their life? Utterly impossible. Bridges addresses it, page 27 and 28, in his Christian ministry. I'll not take the time to quote it, but I will give you this one Last choice quote from the past, Samuel Miller's lovely little book that uh, I recommend to each one of you if you don't have it, An Able and Faithful Ministry. And on pages four and five, he is speaking on the first prerequisite of a minister, and that being piety. And here he mingles graces and what I'm trying to address here as as, piety. experience. And this is what he says, how can a man who knows only the theory of religion undertake to be a practical guide in spiritual things? How can he adapt his instructions to the varieties of Christian experience? How can he direct the awakened, the inquiring, the tempted, and the doubting? How can he feed the sheep and the lambs of Christ? How can he sympathize with mourners in Zion? How can he comfort those with the consolations wherewith he himself has never been comforted of God? He cannot possibly perform as he ought any of these duties, and yet they are the most precious and interesting parts of the ministerial work. However gigantic his intellectual powers, however deep and various and accurate his learning, he is not able, in relation to any of these points, to teach others 
seeing he is not taught himself. If he makes the attempt, it will be but an exercise in the blind leading the blind. And of this, unerring wisdom has told us the consequence. Remember what Jesus said, both fall into the ditch. So, brethren, this is not some strange note that I'm sounding. You may not find our contemporaries saying it, but the men who knew God and knew something of what the pastoral office ought to be and knew their Bibles, they said it was there on the very face of the question, who does Christ give to his church to be a shepherd of his people? It will not only be one of proven graces, but one of sufficient Christian experience experience that will be no stranger to the fundamental pivots of the great issues of sin and grace as they operate in the soul of the people of God. So brethren, if that's so, and you've come here for, quote, ministerial preparation, settle it as an unerring axiom. God's going to beat up on you on a lot of ways that have nothing to do with the curriculum of Trinity Ministerial Academy. You cry to God, Lord, make me an able minister of the New Covenant, and God will start answering in ways that may be very surprising and very painful. Ways that may frustrate you from getting what would be, on a grade level, an A-plus in one course, and drop you to a B. But God knows that the difference in that A and B in that course is nothing compared to the lesson he's going to teach you with that agonizing struggle that he brings into your life through the sickness of a little one, through emotional weakness in your own wife, through this or that. I've stood on the sidelines at times and I've seen God beating up on his potential servants and everything in me wanted to reach in and say, Lord, stay your hand. It's the only way God makes men of God. It's the only way. And God knows. And don't, don't make God's dealings with any other man the pattern of his dealings with you. I was talking to one of the brethren earlier. Asked how his wife has adjusted emotionally in the rest of the area. She's made a wonderful adjustment. I said, I'm so glad God hasn't seen fit to try you in that area. Because other men have been severely tried in that area. But I can say with equal confidence, my brother God will drop you down in the frying pan some other area. Because that's how God makes ministers. Do you remember what Luther said? What was his three things that made a minister? The Bible, prayer, and suffering, or trials. I think it was Luther that said that. Those are the three things. You can't omit any one of them. And if we understand it, then rather than say, Lord, what's happening? I came here to prepare for the ministry, and now this is entered, and this, and this. God says, yes, that's right. And in a sense, when you ask God to prepare you to be a true shepherd of sheep, you're asking him to pour into your soul the cross-section of the experience of a hundred people. That you might have the tongue of the learned, experientially having learned what consolations, what directives, what preventives, what curatives are there in the word of God for those distressed sheep. And I look back at times in the way God led me by such a winding path And at times it was so lonely, I can barely reflect upon it without deep emotion. But the years have shown me how wise God was. He saw all along the line the distressed souls that would come. And he has been unpacking for over 40 years what he was squeezing into 10 years. And then I have to say, Lord, forgive me for ever, ever chafing under your ways of seeking to make me a fit vessel to minister to others. But then we come, I think we'll have time to address the other two. Thirdly, what I've called a chastened disposition of humility and self-distrust. And again, brethren, it's the best I could do if you saw my worksheets where I scratched out and replaced and scratched out again And a moment of truth came when I had to put something onto the dictating machine and something onto my paper. And this is the best I can do to capture it right now. In the area of Christian experience, there must be the evidence that a man has come to some level of a chastened disposition of humility 
and self-distrust. And what do I mean by that? Simply this. If the Apostle Paul says in 2 Corinthians 3, 4, and 5, with reference to his ministry as a minister of the New Covenant, such confidence we have through Christ to God word, not that we are sufficient of ourselves to account anything as from ourselves, but our sufficiency is from God, who also made us sufficient as ministers of the new covenant. Now, how does a man come to this experiential conviction that he is not sufficient of himself to account anything as from himself that will fit him to do the work of the ministry? He doesn't come to it by simply reading a book or even examining the text that deal with it. God will take a man in hand and in his own tailor-made private plan so deal with that man until he has this conviction that I am not sufficient of myself to think of anything as from myself with respect to doing the work of the ministry. Regardless of what my native endowments may be, my acquired skills and disciplines and tools, with reference to what I'm called to do, God will do it all or nothing will be done. Man doesn't come to that conviction of a chastened disposition of humility and self-distrust. That's what I'm talking about. God brings a man there. When do we come to the place where we really believe Christ meant exactly what he said in John 15 and verse 5? Without me, you can do nada, nothing. Is that a rhetorical overstatement? No, that's reality. You can do nothing, nothing. We are not sufficient of ourselves to think anything as from ourselves. And remember the experience of Peter? Luke 22, 31 to 34. Lord, do everyone else deny you? Not me. Satan has desired you to sift you as wheat. When you are turned again, strengthen your brethren. Peter had to learn experientially what it was to have a chastened disposition of humility and self-distrust. And isn't it interesting that it's Peter who emphasizes that grace when he says, all of you be clothed with humility. God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. So with respect to grace, his gifts, privilege, everything connected to the ministry, God will press us and press us until we answer the question of 1 Corinthians 6 and 7 exactly as we ought to answer it. And I turn to that passage, 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 6 and 7. Notice what the concern is. Now these things, brethren, I have in a figure transferred to myself and Apollos for your sake, that in us you might learn not to go beyond the things which are written, that no one of you be puffed up for the one against the other. And here's the question. Who makes you to differ? Simple question. Who makes you to differ? And though the concern here has reference to these people lining up behind their favorite preachers and splitting up into parties within the church, the principle goes far beyond that specific expression of it. Who makes you to differ? It doesn't say who made Apollos and Paul to differ. Understand it in yourself and then you'll rightly apply it to the ministers God sends among you. Who makes you to differ? And what have you that you did not receive? Now, two very simple questions. Now, theoretically, we all know what the right answer is. But to come to the place where experimentally, in the deepest chambers of the soul, the answer rings out instinctively. Who makes you to differ? If I differ in any way, with respect to gift and grace, it is all of God and all of grace. And what have I that I did not receive? Who gave me life in my mother's womb? Who put the genes together in such a way that I should be a normal human being? Who laid hold of me in grace? Who opened my eyes? What have I that I did not receive? Nothing. But if you received it, 
why do you glory as though you had not received it? In other words, anything of the remnants of pride and self-trust is an indication that we've moved away from the experimental acknowledgement of the right answer to those simple questions. And so if God's going to place you as his servant into the ministry, an able minister of the new covenant, he's got to bring you into the framework of new covenant consciousness or the consciousness of new covenant ministers that they are not sufficient of themselves to think anything is from themselves. Everything they have has been given and they're not going to glory as though it were not given. And you see, it's not just on the threshold, but all the way along the way. Paul was no novice when he wrote 2 Corinthians chapter 12. He said, in the ongoing revelations of Christ to me, he saw the naughtiness of my heart that I might be puffed up. So he allowed this messenger of Satan to come and afflict me, and I said, Lord, I can't do your work unless you take this away. And he said, for this thing I sought the Lord three times, probably three extended seasons of prayer, most likely coupled with fasting. And he said, Lord, here's the logical conclusion. This thing is such an impediment, I can't fulfill my ministry. God says, no. No, there's another construction, and it's this. In the light of all the endowments I've granted, and the abundance of revelations, knowing the naughtiness of your heart, lest you be puffed up with pride, I'm going to send this thing to keep you consciously weak and consciously dependent, because I can use weak men who know they are weak and are dependent, but I can't use proud men. Paul says, Lord, I got the message. Most gladly, therefore, will I glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. And if I become a living paradox, going around always dying yet imparting life, going around half dead and yet an amazement to men, so be it. I want the power of Christ to intent itself about me. But you see, brethren, it's not something that's once for all, but surely no man can consider himself Christ's gift to the church who has not been brought to this fundamental experiential posture of a chastened disposition of humility and self-distrust. How can we enter a ministry that has as its focal point the proclamation of a Christ who said, Come to me. I will give you rest for I am meek and lowly in heart. How can a proud and arrogant man preach a meek and a lowly Christ with any conviction. Can't be done. And so I say, in the area of Christian experience, there must be a modicum. How much? I'm not going to say. And the Bible doesn't say. But I know the difference when I'm in the presence of a proud man and a humble man. And I don't know where the line is. But you better be safely back from the line where people can justly accuse you of being a proud, self-confident, cocky young preacher. Now, you can't feign humility. You can't do it by simply shrugging your shoulders and putting your hands in your pockets and mumbling through your beard. No, no. It's an internal grace. It's got to be worked in here. And if God had to use some external pressure on a mature saint like Paul to keep him there, don't be surprised if he beats up on you to get you there. Brethren, I wish there was some easier way. But it's a glorious thing to see a man walking, ministering, publicly and privately, with the dew of God upon him, with godly assertiveness and boldness, and yet to sense in his presence there's the meekness and the gentleness of Christ. And a man who knows he has nothing but what he's received. And then, fourthly, we will get through them. This fourth aspect of what I'm calling this necessity for an enlarged, balanced, tested Christian experience is what I've described as a measure of sustained and vigorous faith in the great realities of the unseen world. And again, I was fishing for words, trying to express that faith is not just one grace among many in the soul, it is the the pivotal grace. Without faith, Hebrews 11.6, it is impossible to please him. For we walk by faith and not by sight. 
And then a crucial text, and I've listed it for you, 2 Corinthians 4.13, and I commend you Warfield's sermon on this, I believed, therefore have I spoken. And Warfield has a marvelous sermon on that text. And 2 Corinthians 4 and verse 18, the Apostle says concerning his, quote, light affliction, is but for a moment, while we look not on the things that are seen, but on the things that are not seen. For the things that are seen are temporal, but the things that are not seen are eternal. And what I desire to say on this has been better said by Bridges on page 178 in his work on the Christian ministry. Dealing with the problem of the lack of faith among men in the ministry and this in turn being an impediment to usefulness, but I want to put it here with respect to fitness to enter the ministry, it is most important habitually to contemplate our work in its proper character as a work of faith. First Thessalonians 1, 3. As such, it can only be sustained by the active and persevering exercise of this principle. This is that makes it a means of grace to our own souls as well as the grand medium of exalting our divine master. It is faith that enlivens our work with perpetual cheerfulness. It commits every part of it to God in the hope that even mistakes shall be overruled for his glory and thus relieves us from an oppressive anxiety often attendant upon a deep sense of our responsibility. The shortest way to peace will be found in casting ourselves upon God for daily pardon of deficiencies and supplies of grace without looking too eagerly for present fruit. Hence our course of effort is unvarying but more tranquil. It is peace, not slumber. Rest in the work, not from it. Faith supports us under the trials of our ministerial warfare with the clear view of the faithfulness of the covenant and the ultimate stability of the church. And indeed, as all the promises are made to faith, or to the grace springing from faith, this is the only spring of Christian courage and Christian hope. Unbelief looks at difficulty. Faith regards the promise. Unbelief therefore makes our work a service of bondage. Faith realizes it as a labor of love. Unbelief drags on in sullen despondency. Faith makes the patience with which it is content to wait for success the patience of hope. As every difficulty, as we've hinted, is the fruit of unbelief, so will they all ultimately be overcome by the perseverance of faith. This is the victory that hath overcome the world, even our what? Even our faith. Believe, wait, work. These are the watchwords of the ministry. Believing the promise gives the power to wait. Waiting supplies the strength for work. And such work is never in vain in the Lord. Most precious words. Believing the promise gives the power to wait. Waiting supplies strength for the work. And such working is not in vain in the Lord. And then he goes on to say, Daily experience reminds us of the extreme difficulty of maintaining spiritual perceptions of eternal things. He has stated that eternal realities are the focus of faith, but the pressures of life constantly pull us away from that. And then he quotes another servant of God who said, Faith is the master spring of a minister. Hell is before me. And thousands of souls are shut up there in everlasting agonies. Jesus Christ stands forth to save men from rushing into this bottomless abyss. He sends me to proclaim his ability and his love. I want no fourth idea. Every fourth idea is contemptible. Every fourth idea is a grand impertinence. So said the man of God from another generation. That's found in Cecil's Remains. Well, the great principle is, brethren, that surely if this is true of the work of the ministry, on the threshold of seeking to discern, is this a man whom Christ is forming and placing into his service to undertake a work that in its very nature is a work of faith, trafficking in the unseen world of spiritual realities? 
then there must be a measure of sustained and vigorous faith in those great realities. If a man's chronic problem is chronic despondency born of unbelief, the church has got enough struggling saints crippled because they are Mr. Fearings and Mr. Ready to Hoffs without having one in the pulpit. Brethren, if anything should mark a man in the pulpit, regardless of his native temperament, people can look and say, there's a man to whom the world of spiritual reality is real. It's stamped upon his eyeballs. It breathes and throbs through his preaching, regardless of the peculiarities of that preaching. In a world where everything tends to drag men and fuse their souls to the realm of sight, God help us if they come into the house of God on the Lord's day and see a man who's buried beneath the mound of the things that can be seen and felt and touched rather than a man in whom they see his eyes constantly piercing through the veil of the things that are seen and is fixed upon the things that are not seen whether he's speaking of the privileges and the glories of the age to come or the present relationship of Christ to his people or seeking to stir up and awaken the careless with the threats of divine judgment, he speaks as a man whose own eye of faith beholds the things in which he traffics and it gives a note of reality which nothing else can replace. Well, brethren, as you seek to be honest in the presence of God and earnestly seek His face with regard to His call upon your life, may I urge you to pray that these four strands that constitute what I have tried to designate as an enlarged, balanced, and tested Christian experience will be yours by the grace of God. Let's pray, commit our thoughts to the Lord. Our Father, in the contemplation of these things, we have come to the fresh conviction that only you, the God who made the worlds, can make a true servant of Christ. And we pray that that work you've begun in these men will be carried on, and that you will use the things considered today to help them better to understand your dealings with them now in preparation for their life's work. Whatever has been mixed with the clay of human thought, blow upon it, bring it to naught, drive it away like the chaff. Whatever has been true to the principles of your word, write it upon our hearts by the finger of the Spirit's ministry. We ask in Jesus' name.